anyway, uh, Walker Percy has always been a hero of mine. I like Julian Green. And uh, Walker Percy was from an old Mississippi family. Truly, if you really want to talk about Southern aristocracy, the Percys were definitely Southern aristocrats through and through. And uh, they, they uh, began in Mississippi in the uh, early 18th century, and the original Percy was appointed uh, to run the, that territory by in Louisiana, North Louisiana, by um, the Viceroy of Spain. And Walker Percy family, his uh, direct grandfather, La Walker Percy Sr., moved to Birmingham, Alabama to become a very prominent and very wealthy lawyer. Now, Birmingham was a non entity in 1873, but it gradually by the 19, end of the 19th century became a very big center for southern, um, southern industrialism because around the city there were rich uh, uh, posits of iron and ore to make steel. So it became the steel manufacturer of the south. And then they built the railroads there. And so Birmingham became a great symbol of the new south and the new need for industrialization. And when you were a lawyer and you were working for the railroads and you're working for the steel conglomerates, then you were going to make a lot of money. And uh, Percy's always had money, but uh, the Percy's decided to go in with the new south. So Walker Percy Sr. Uh, started the Percy line in Birmingham, Alabama, and uh, Walker, our writer, was born in 1916. And in those days, it was a very different world because I've seen a photograph of Birmingham, Alabama in 1908, and there's a big banner uh, over downtown. The city was planning a big parade for Confederate veterans. So you had a lot of these Confederate veterans still alive. So there you had the remnants of the Old South. You had this new South that was in, in being, this new industrialization in Birmingham, and the new breed of men who came to make their fortunes. Walker's father was Leroy Percy, who also became a lawyer like his father, and also out of his own uh, career as a lawyer, uh, became extremely wealthy, and uh, married a very pretty young woman named Maddie Sue Finnessy from Athens, Georgia. And Miss Maddie Sue also came from a very old uh, Southern family. The Finnessy's first came to America in the regiment uh, that was created by the Marquis de Lafayette, and they were there ever since. So on both sides of his family, uh, he uh, came from very prominent families. Unfortunately for Walker, his grandfather, uh, Walker Sr., killed himself. And then, not long later, when Walker was 13 years old, his father, Leroy, climbed up to the attic, took a shotgun, and killed himself. It was uh, absolutely traumatic, as you can imagine, for any child to experience. And this would be a theme that runs through his novels. There has been a tradition in the Percy family of clinical depression that goes all the way back to the founder of the Klan in the 18th century, who also stepped into the Mississippi River with a pot over his head at the, at the height of his career and killed himself. 
So pretty much every other generation or every two generations has been some Percy who killed himself. It's a, it's a very tragic streak in the family line. And so it's another heavy burden that Walker Percy had to endure. At that time, um, Birmingham obviously was unbearable. His family was living in this beautiful big house by the Birmingham Country Club. His father, Leroy, was the president of the Country Club, just as his father was also president of the Country Club, which were great honors. So you go to the Birmingham Country Club, it's very exclusive. Uh, you'll see their portraits father and son in this hallway where all the past presidents of the Birmingham Country Club are um, their portraits are hung up so Percy said that from the very beginning of his life he did not grow up in the old south uh, sitting in front of the porch and talking stories late at night and learning how to be a storyteller, a writer like Faulkner. He said the South he knew was the golf course and the rinks and that sort of thing. At any rate, uh, Mattisou took the boys, three sons, Walker, Leroy, and Finnessy back to Athens. And she lived with her mother and their, her mother's lovely uh, Victorian house on Milledgeville Road, which is the heart of uh, Athens. And it's a very interesting house. It's now a, a sorority. And there also is tragedy related to that. There is a, a ghost story that the sorority sister will tell you about a girl who killed herself, something like a Percy thing, uh, who will sit and cry on the staircases sometimes. and. If you're out late at night in the Athens bars and coming home, just don't run into her. You might regret it. <laughs> anyway, to the rescue comes a big change in Walker's life. Uh, his second cousin, William Alexander Percy, a very remarkable man, uh, invited Miss Maddie Sue and three boys to come up to Greenville, Mississippi and uh, visit him and see if they like it enough to stay. And Mr. Will, as everybody called him, Mr. Will, uh, was a war hero, was captain of the U.S. Army, a planner. The family had, uh, goodness, 35,000 acre plantation, uh, very wealthy, world traveler, he loved France, which is another good thing about him. <laughs> and uh, he was also a poet. He published two books with Yale University Press, which was not bad in those days, coming from Mississippi. And uh, he was also a concert-level classical pianist. These were his talents. And then he was also a great philanthropist of the town. He he uh, helped boost literary talent in a small southern town in, you know, out there. And there were over 64 writers at the time, all native grown, which was remarkable. You know, they're not professors and writers and residents or anything like that. These are just grainable people who became serious writers, of whom Walker will be one, and his best friend forever, Shelby Foote. So when Miss Mattisou decided to accept uh, the invitation to stay for good with uh, Mr. Will, who was a bachelor, his parents having died, and lived with him at, at his big house. And uh, so the Percy's went back to their ancestral state of Mississippi, Miss Mattisou with them. And then in, at the age of 16, three years later, uh, another great tragedy happened to Walker that changed him forever was when Ms. Maddie Sue drove her car uh, from a bridge into the river. And uh, some say it was an accident, some say it was suicide. Walker 
told three close friends that he believed it was a suicide. And when I read um, the report of the incident, I, I agree it was a suicide, and she was in grief. So it was very tragic. Mr. Will changed the boys' lives forever. He gave them culture. It, it, was, uh, it was like um, going to Alibaba and the Seven Thieves' Caves, and there was so much treasure from around the world and music and writers would come and visit and some would stay for months and people like Langston Hughes would come there were uh, Rachel Lindsay would come Carl Sandberg would come and play songs for them uh, who else there were so many uh, oh speaking of someone who has a relationship to our story of psychiatry Harry Stack Sullivan came from New York he got a scholarship to go down to Mississippi to uh, to study the South's race qu- problem <laughs> well anyway he spent three months in Mr. Will's house <laughs> sitting in the back uh, uh, room of uh, of the uh, the Percy House uh, uh, drinking vodka martinis. <laughs> and, but he did learn by the race problem by ask, talking to the black servants <laughs> who told him what was going on in Mississippi. Of course, they loved Mr. Will. He was a very good uh, master to them. But uh, that's how Harry Stack Sullivan learned about the race problem of, Miss, of the South. <laughs> and... and, and uh, uh, soothed with vodka martinis from Mr. Will's uh, alcohol shelf. And uh, so anyway, uh, Walker learned a lot about culture, music, literature, uh, uh, the arts, how to live uh, as a cultured man, how to be a Southern gentleman from Mr. Will, who's all of it. And um, the Percy's themselves had a great tradition. They were the only people who were able to keep the Klan out of Greenville in the 1920s when they were at the height of their power. The, Green, uh, the, the Percy's were so prestigious and so valued that uh, they could do that. And there was a time when it was so dangerous that Percy, the Percy's, and all their allies were carrying guns uh, when they came out in the streets. And one time, this is such a Southern kind of honor thing, Mr. Will went up to a local Klan leader. He stood up and looked at him and said, if anything happens to my father, I'm going to hold you responsible, and I'm going to kill you. <laughs> that was it. That was it. That was it. <laughs> Mr. Will Minute. He was a war hero. Anyway, there was a time when uh, the boys grew up, and uh, along with Will, uh, Shelby Foote, Shelby was a bit wild when he was a young boy, and he was um, uh, raised by a single mother. His father had died, and uh, his mother, Mrs. Foote, went to Mr. Will, who you know, everybody went to for help. And she asked if Mr. Will would take this boy in and kind of get him socialized. <laughs> Let's say. And she said, uh, Mrs. Foot, you can count on it. I'll, uh, I'll take the boy in. And so he was raised basically as a, uh, a fourth son in the Percy house, and he spent more time with the Percys than he did at home. And uh, Shelby Foot said he, he owes everything as a writer to Mr. Will as well. And of course, Walker became his best friend from that time on. There was then what to do. Every son of the gentleman has to do something with his life. And amongst the Percy's, I mean, they had their big plantation. They had money. But you still, from a point of honor, you have to have a profession. And back then, that meant either the law the military, or medicine. So what Mr. Will did was he, t- he gave the plantation to Leroy, called the overseers and his head people, 
uh, to a meeting and said, and with young Leroy and said, I'm, I'm deeding the plantation over to Leroy, and from now on, he's your boss, and you can deal with it. <laughs> uh, so Leroy became a planner. Walker, he chose uh, medical school for. And, um, and he said, well, I'm, I'm going to send you to Columbia because there's good opera there. And, uh, and then uh, Finnezy, carry on the military family tradition, went to Naples. But before Walker could go to uh, Columbia Medical School and go to opera, uh, he got his degree in chemistry from Chapel Hill, where his papers are located. And then he got his MD from the College of Physicians and Surgeons, became a resident in pathology at Bellevue Hospital, and uh, where he contracted tuberculosis that ended his, uh, his time there. He then spent two years mostly at, uh, at a sanatorium near Lake Saranac, and he said, mostly on my back, and now I had all the time in the world to read. When he applied to uh, Chapel Hill, <clears throat> there was an English test that you had to take, and you had like three levels that they would figure out how to place you and walk a person placed in the idiot <laughs> level. <laughs> he was just interested in science at that time. He said he took only one English course and that was it. <laughs> um, so he said, I began to read no longer McLeod's physiology or Gay's bacteriology but the great Russian novelists, especially Dostoevsky, the modern French novelists, especially Camus and Jean Paul Sartre, the existentialist Carl Jaspers, who's also a doctor, Gabriel Marcel, Jacques Maritain, and Martin Heidegger. Gabriel Marcel and Jacques Maritain, by the way, happened to be close friends of Julian Green. What Percy discovered through his wide reading ex existential philosophers and uh, through Russian literature was that he needed to learn a lot more about things outside of science, like what is man? And that was a question that because of the suicides of his family, the trauma of his early years, he, he was driven to this, like what is man? Why do people think wh what makes them uh, live on or not live on. And he de decided the more science progresses and even as it benefited man, the less it said about what it is like to be a man living in the world. During the time he was in medical school, he actually went through three years of psychoanalysis, uh, which a number of his heroes do also, but to no avail because he found it of no use either. <clears throat> so after he got out of the sanatorium, uh, the war was over, and Walker gave up medicine for writing. Mr. Will had died in 1942 in January from a, a stroke and uh, left uh, Walker money, enough money for him to uh, live on for a while. So he decided to become a writer. But nonetheless, he wanted to be a writer who would combine the, his interest in existentialism about what makes man tick with his own, my, what he said, my own bent from the beginning has been towards science and still is. So he wants to be analytical as well as stylistical in his writings. And he's funny as all, all get. I mean, I was just laughing aloud uh, a few days ago reading, reading him. And uh, it's, he, he, he's so funny. And Walker decided, if I had stayed a physician, I would have become a second-rate psychiatrist in Birmingham. <laughs> <laughs> Well, he started writing his novels. His first two novels were failures. 
we're, uh, we're afraid that one of them, he, he told one scholar who was interested in his writings that he had thrown the manuscript into the bayou. <laughs> <laughs> but the other the other novel does survive. It's in the Chapel Hill archives. And uh, he sent the manuscript to Caroline Gordon, who's a very fine no- novelist. How many people have read Caroline Gordon? Good for you. And uh, Miss Caroline liked uh, the writing, but knew it was a Dijon um, effort. It was a, a young beginner writer. So, but she thought enough of him to write him back a 15-page single-space letter of criticism. Now, that's a lot of work. Her husband, Alan Tate, wrote, (laughs) scribbled on a very curt note, there's no action in this novel. (laughs) (laughs) But finally, uh, with his third novel, uh, Walker struck gold with the classic The Movie Goer, which won the National Book uh, Award uh, in 1962 and put him on the map of literature. Before that time, he was really re- writing for the little magazines, medical medical journals, semiotics journals, um, sometimes criticism, but you know a lot of scientific and semiotics uh, articles because he always maintained that interest in the sciences. He talked about writing in this way, just as a psychiatrist talks about patients. And uh, in my life, you know, I pursued literature and scholarship. But I've also, um, well, after I retired, I actually spent some time in California as a counselor. I got licensed uh, in uh, first responder counseling, and I worked with the homeless. And I work with the seniors, and I also got licensed by a national association on suicide prevention. It was a long, long interest of mine, so I combined that with this. So this really makes sense. Uh, Anybody who's worked with clients will know this. He said, a work in progress is like a patient. My writing involves many false starts, many blind detours, many blind passages, many goings ahead, and, and where something has been tried and doesn't work, he doesn't swing, it doesn't swing, it doesn't cook, it doesn't go. So you just back up. It's mysterious. This thing, if not knowing why it doesn't work, all you know is that when it does work, you know it. So it's back and forth, back and forth patients. Anyway, all his characters have some kind of psych- psychological issue. That's a given with Walker Percy. His first character, Binks Bowling, of the moviegoer, uh, is the first of his alienated young man. It owes a lot to the French writers. Binks uh, is very... Uh, alienated from his world. He's from an old New Orleans family, but decides to move out to Chantilly uh, because it's out of, it's a place that is nowhere and has no history. It's a place where you can just live the small way, he calls it, where he becomes a stockbroker and dates his secretaries and goes to movies. If you're a movie buff, you can read the movie gore and you get all these lists of classic films and look it up on Turner, Turner Movie Classics. Now, he has a girlfriend. Another thing, that a lot of his female characters also, the, hero, the heroines are also have some disturbed uh, issues. Binks Bowling's girlfriend, Kate Kutra, has a psychiatrist, ah, Dr. Merle Mix. But she has a, a layman's knowledge of psychoanalysis so she feels obligated to come up with symptoms <laughs> for Dr. Mix to figure out <laughs> so she, it never works it never works <laughs> um, <clears throat> in Walker Percy's eyes Banks represents the failure of the scientific medical view Banks' father had been a doctor but Binks loses interest in scientific experiments, becomes a stockbroker, chases girls, 
watch his movies. But in the end, he moves to what um, Percy calls the ethical stage. He, there is first the aesthetic stage, which can be anything from sensuality to a love of art, pursuing art, to moving to the ethical stage, which is the moral stage, the stage of responsibility. And then the third stage is the spiritual stage. But Binks gets to the second stage, ethical stage. And he, and he uh, marries Kate and then decides to follow his father's path and becomes a doctor. And that's where we end with Binks. The thing about Percy is he, he knows what he believes, but he leaves things up in the air with his character. So you got to figure out what's what's Binks going to be like in fifteen years with Kate. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Does he get to the spiritual stage and are they, they're still happily married? What will be their kid like? Will he need psychoanalysis? You know. <laughs> um, in his next novel, the uh, Last Gentleman, Sutter Vault is a doctor. Okay, we got to have doctors in Percy's novels. Sutter uh, is a member of, of the Vault family. Uh, at that time, uh, Williston Bibb Bear III, who's a hero of, uh, of the novel, who is the last Southern gentleman, he falls in love with Kitty, who is this very pretty, sorty girl who loves Alabama football and very coquettish. And then he really finds out it, that at, at a closer proximity, he really doesn't care for her. Uh, but Sutter is a failed doctor, and uh, since he was accused of malpractice, he is not allowed to go near living people. His uh, malpractice insurance was dropped. <laughs> so he works as a pathologist in a county coroner's office. And uh, he takes his revenge <laughs> by putting up posters of uh, important moments in medical history and takes target shooting to it. <laughs> and yet there is one disciple for Sutter Vault, M.D. Guess who that is? Williston Bibb Bear III, who sees in Vault something. And Williston is even more out of there than Bing's bowling because uh, he has um, a semi-form of epilepsy and he also suffers from fugues, which are moments of uh, uh, amnesia. And, um, and he's also very alienated, like all of Percy's heroes. And the word is, uh, he feels dislocation. Wilson Bibb Bear III also unders, undergoes psychoanalysis for five years. Walker Percy did three years with a certain Dr. Gamoff. But like Kate Kutra, uh, he's learning enough uh, psycholinguo, so he comes up with uh, symptoms for Dr. Gamoff to <laughs> misdiagnose, and nothing happens. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and Dr. Gamow takes the bait because he's always interested in Freudian slips. <laughs> and in the end, Will Barrett uh, ends the analysis and says, quote, Goodbye, Dr. Gamow, a father of sorts, and his, uh, and his alma mater, sweet mother psychoanalysis. <laughs> Will Barrett... Black is creator, decides the world is controlled by science, engineering, and technology. Then he's going to abandon the search for reasons for his disconnection and become a humidifying engineer. <laughs> uh, Soren Kilgard, who is one of uh, Walker's heroes, said, if a man cannot forget, he will never mount too much. <laughs> so Will's fugues, his moments of amnesia revealed, actually, as we find out later on, the trauma of his father's death by suicide. It happens on a hunting trip. 
similar to a hunting trip that Walker went on with his father Leroy when he was a boy in Alabama. But in this case, uh, the father also tries to shoot his son, take him with him. But he doesn't. He just shoots himself. Now, the thing about Sutter Vault, the um, doctor, failed doctor, is that he understands that the human person is more than a body, and that doctors are not equipped to deal with the transcendent. So it's a, it's a pointing in the direction, it's a pointing in the direction for Williston Bibb Bear III. Sutter Vault's younger brother, Jamie, is a friend of Barrett, and he's also dying. He's a boy. But Sutter and Will would be present at Jamie's deathbed when he converts to the Roman Catholic Church. Sutter vows to kill himself after Jamie's death because he has nowhere to go, he has no faith in psychotherapy, and he has no faith in any American church. And he's a failed doctor. But Will stops him by asking him to, for a lift. And the two, in the end of the novel, go off probably in search of meaning somewhere. One of my very favorite books of, uh, of Walker Percy's Lost in the Cosmos, which he called the last self-help book in the galaxy. <laughs> Uh, it, it really is his analysis of the world, and it's so funny. It's serious, but it's also very funny. <laughs> and he starts a book with, he, with 20 questions. Uh, and if you answer them all properly, then you don't need the book. <laughs> but you can't answer even one. Then he says, I think you should buy the book. <laughs> of course you buy the book. And uh, amongst the things that uh, he asked about, asked you about is, are you amnesic? Uh, are you bored? Are you fearful? Are you envious? Are you promiscuous? <laughs> then, of course, you'll need this self-help book, and you won't need anything else. Save money on psychoanalysis. <clears throat> he says, nowadays, there is no piece of nonsense that will not be believed by some and uh, and no guru or radio preacher, however, corrupt who will not attract a following. So we're all lost in the cosmos somehow, and some of us just don't know it. Maybe we're lost in the aesthetic level, writing poetry, or in the ethical, where we try to be good people, but we haven't really gone beyond ourselves into the transcendent. Choosing either to be imminent or transcendent is insufficient, according to Percy. And he talks about the Cartesian divide, which has uh, ailed the Western man since the uh, Enlightenment. He talks about the horrors of the 20th century and how, in his words, the autonomous self who, believing in nothing, can fall prey to ideology and kill millions of people, unwanted people, old people, enemies of the state, and do so reasonably, without passion, even decently, certainly without obnoxiousness. In his most apocalyptic novel, the Thanatos Syndrome, which is his last novel, published in 1986, he continues adventures of another dislocated psychiatrist, Dr. Thomas Moore, who's now a hero. Most psychiatrists in his novels are caricatures and ridiculed, but uh, Moore is one of his heroes, but dislocated. In Thanatos Syndrome, Moore has just come out of prison of two years for uh, selling amphetamines <laughs> to his parents, but he's repentant, and he's now going back to the small way of being a psychiatrist and helping people. So Walker Percy reiterates through a spiritual father of um, Dr. Moore, Father Smith, who had participated in World War II and seen his horrors. He said that the autonomous self leads to euthanasia, abortion, and genocide without remorse or justification. 
I think that if Percy had been living today uh, in these last two years and seeing what the Democratic Party has become, the party of partial birth abortion, that babies can be killed outside the womb. Remember the governor of Virginia who talked about what you do with a born baby and, you know, keep it comfortable, keep it comfortable, and then, you know, doctor and mother would decide what to do with it, you know? By and large, scientists and artists and the autonomous self have forgotten man, God, have forgotten God, not man. So what to do uh, about the banality of life which afflicts so many people? And uh, a big concern of Walker Percy, it's uh, in the, uh, the writings of the Church Fathers, it's called Assidia where one has this kind of a dry spiral, uh, sp uh, sp sp spiritual nothingness in the, in the soul. It's called a city, and people, people try to deal with a city in different ways to feel alive again. What's left to experience a sense of being alive again, says Walker Percy? Is it in travel, sports, Alabama football, media, Drugs and sex. The apocalyptic vision in Love in the Ruins, Lancelot, Thanatos Syndrome. Parker, Walker Percy quotes constantly from Søren Kierkegaard. His favorite book is Sickness Unto Death by Kierkegaard. And Kierkegaard writes, the self can only become itself if he does so transparently before God. Percy is a diagnostician, diagnostician of our culture, the anomalies of our time. He talks about the rise of boredom and suicide in a country that mentions the pursuit of happiness in his uh, uh, Declaration of Independence. Now we're TV junkies, texters, fasc fascinated with bad news, and uh, salvation does not come from the self, but we need to be saved. <clears throat> Although um, Percy keeps saying that he's not a Southern writer, <laughs> uh, Percy's a sly fox. Uh, he, uh, Yes, he did choose to live in Covington, which was at back then a, a small town uh, north of Lake Pontchartrain. He began in, in New Orleans after he married Bunt Percy, but they left New Orleans because there was too, too much stimulation, so he needed a quiet life. And he was always a fragile person all his life from his tuberculosis. So they moved to this home in a very quiet town of uh, Covington, where he spent the last 33 years of his life. And he lived a very regular and quiet life. And he had a, a card um, pinned to, uh, uh, in his um, study. It's by Flaubert. Live like a good bourgeois so you can write masterpieces. <laughs> so, um, uh, Kitty does not work out with uh, Will, and her daddy was hoping that he would marry her. And uh, he represents, however, the uh, the new South, the postmodern South that Percy doesn't care for. His father owns a big auto dealership, a Chevrolet dealership, and has a salesman dressed in Confederate uniforms. <laughs> it's like, you know, this is not real anymore. But of course today the Antifa would be bashing the windows of the car dealer and burning the cars. Uh, uh, he finally doesn't met. Um, he, he says that he really could not live outside the South. And he is a Southerner and he was always a Southerner. Um, but he feels that the South of our time is becoming so Los Angeles, filled with subdivisions, uh, the same stores, same uh, businesses, and same chain restaurants everywhere. 
But he admits in a letter that he wrote to the Jesuit magazine America, there is a Southern heritage. It has nothing to do with the kernel and the whiskey ad. It has to do with the conservative tradition of a predominantly agrarian society, a tradition which at its best enshrined the humane aspects of living. Poor and poor, black and white, it gave first place to a stable family life, sensitivity and good manners between men, chivalry towards women, and honor code and individual integrity. For Percy, however, the Southern Code of Honor has been overwhelmed by the economic victory of the Sun Belt and the ongoing Los Angelization of the Southern community. Will Barrett is a former Princetonian, a former humidifying engineer in New York, and when he returns to Dixie, uh, Percy says, the South he returns uh, uh, home to was different from the South he had left. It was happy, victorious, Christian, rich, patriotic, and Republican. <laughs> anyway, uh, the postmodern South which Percy inhabited is, a, is one of golf courses, country clubs, and subdivisions. The defeat, and, and he, he says, the defeat and a tragic sense of history was the South's chief claim to uniqueness. This South no longer exists, according to him. But he has some words of hope. There is this beautiful epigraph, which I find haunting and beautiful as anything, uh, from The Last Gentleman. It's uh, from Romano Gardini's uh, work, um, The End of the World, I think it's called. Loneliness will be terrible. Love will disappear from the face of the public world. But the more precious will be that love which flows from one lonely person to another, evolving a courage of the heart born from the immediacy of the love of God. Thank you. Thank you.